Well, good afternoon, so we will continue our autumn school and today we have a uh, guest from uh, Hanover uh, uh, Medical uh, School, uh, uh, Professor Andreas Hilfiger. Uh, he is a researcher working in uh, the field of uh, medicine, uh, in particular to the intersection of uh, uh, nanotechnologies with uh, biomedicine, we have uh, joint publications, uh, and that means we are in collaboration. And uh, uh, today uh, you will uh, uh, attend a lecture, uh, cardiovascular tissue engineering. In my opinion, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, so uh, we are looking forward to lecturing, so you have the floor, uh, Dr. Hilfiger, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Hanover Medical School. I'm a group leader in tissue engineering, and uh, I would like to to warn you. Uh, talking about tissue engineering is not that much engineering. Uh, to be honest, it's more try and error, right? So, but I nevertheless would like to give you a short overview about this topic that is becomes very fashionable in the last couple of years. So I would like to start with a dilemma that, uh, that our society is facing more and more since the population gets older and older. So uh, we all would like to live long, but uh, nobody would like to be old, right? So uh, already in the 16th century, people thought about a solution about that, taking the bath of youth, so to sp uh, say, to, to, to jump into the fountain of youth and get somehow uh, refurbished. Mm -hmm. And so we have to ask ourselves how we can translate this, this wish or this idea in the, these days, how to refurbish an old body, and you, if you look it up you find commercials that uh, provide some anti-aging creams and, and so on and so on, but this is, might be not the solution actually. So already 500 years ago, uh, you, we find uh, some topics in the literature from India that they try to do transplantation of organs, of skin for instance, and uh, rhinoplastic, but you may uh, consider that at the time the immune suppression was not really invented and uh, the success of such transplantation must be not very good. Just something in between. If you have a question, which you think it's, it, it's up, um, not really understandable, please ask now. We're almost family here. There's not that many people, so we, we take the time, then skip other things which are not, not that important. So, going back to the being old, I mean, people all the time talk about, uh, about cause of death. And then you see a large number of people dying from cardiovascular diseases. And I all the time ask people whether, whether this makes sense uh, to, to, to cure all this cardiovascular disease since we have to die anyway. So what is the better death? You can think about yourself to become cancer or you have a heart stroke which is very quick and so on and so on. So we have to consider the, the rate of death of underage people. So look, looking how many people die from a certain disease under the age of 70, as you have here, and still the cardiovascular diseases are leading cause of death. So, as I mentioned before, transplantation becomes then popular with, with the invention of the immunosuppression, as you have heard uh, Sergei Chepotar yesterday uh, talking about heart transplantation. And you can see with, in the 80s you have a tremendous increase of, of, of heart transplantation that were successfully conducted. However, as you also can see on this curve, we have a decline or just a, a, a steady state curve which is flat. So what's going on? And the reason is we are short on organs due to several reasons. Since we have not enough donors, most probably they are too old, for instance, or they are not willing to give, or it's just the readiness of willing to give their organs. In any case, we have lack of donors, so we have an unsolved problem. And the alternatives to it are artificial organs, heard yesterday, regenerative 
therapies also heard yesterday, so we will talk about tissue engineering. And since you have had lecture, and I think on Saturday or Sunday already about tissue engineering, I have to not to go into that topic. So we have just the scientific principles that come together to solve a problem. And here you have the basic scheme. So we have to have for our constructs or artificial organs, we have to have cells. The cells provide the function. But as you may know, we culture cells, and normally we culture their cells in a 2D form, which is just in a, <coughs> in a plastic dish, and uh, we do not get function. And in addition to this fu function, we have to have a form. So this gives this 3D structure, and we have therefore have to have a scaffold. And since this is all in vitro, you also have to mimic the, these cells, or these different types of cells to give them the impression they are in the real body. So you have somehow mimicking the environment by adding certain growth factors to really get them to do what they have to do. But already here, I don't know, is there anybody that does tissue culturing at all? Okay, a couple. So you know that we have media there, and the media normally are very highly specialized to one cell type. And this cell type is pushed forward to just to proliferate, hmm? not to, do have the, to, to show the, the function. Now we start to think to combine different cell types for a certain tissue. And that you have to maturate this tissue, and these word cells have to work together, so which kind of medium are you using? And after a while, it should not grow, it should not be a tumor, it should be a functional tissue. You also have to take out this pro proliferative aspect on it. And there, as I say, it's not engineering, it's just try and error. You have to try to, to reduce certain factors and others, but you cannot predict what you have really to do. So, why cardiovascular tissue engineering? Because myocardial tissue does not regenerate. So if something breaks, it is broken. Arteriosclerosis appears to be a systemic problem. So if you have problems with your coronary arteries on your heart, you most probably have also problems with your other arteries in the body, also in the, in the brain. So the association of a heart attack is very, very close to the stroke that you have in the brain. And also very important, cells are nourished by perfusion. And the perfusion does not reach each single cell, but it, it goes close to the environment in, in the range of 200 micrometers. From, from there, the nutrition or also the, the taking up of the garbage and the CO2, so to speak, has to be in a way of diffusion. But above this, it's very unlikely that the cell will able to survive. So, here, a general scheme. If you take a myocardial infarction, or if you look at hypertension, or if you have heart valve disease, which is stenosis, which means it, the valve does not open properly, or if you have valve regurgitation, where the blood flows back because the valve does not really close, you have a, an impact on the function of the rest myocardium. So these muscles, muscle cells, have to work more to get the same condition, to pump the same amount of blood. Then it, it works the same thing as you go to the gym. The muscle becomes stronger, get thicker, you get more muscles. But since cardiomyocytes do not divide, they just can be bigger. And if you reach a certain limitation of that thickness, you cannot nourish them anymore. So what's going to happen? First, uh, the heart hypertrophy, so you get the muscle. But then you get a dilation, the whole thing falls apart, you have a heart insufficiency which causes sooner or later death, and the only way to cure it is the heart transplantation. However, if you are able to restore part of these this heart muscles, for instance, or take away the effect of a diseased heart valve, you may rescue the organ, the total organ, from failure. So, as in most engineers or uh, people working in technical aspects here, valve function is trivial to you, right? So, 
A heart valve prevents the backflow from blood from, from the atria, no, from the ventricle to the atria, or from, from the ventricle to the body, vice versa, from the body back to the ventricle. So, if something breaks, as I say, you have a, a higher um, workload on the heart. To prevent that, already in the 1960s, in the last century, people started just to replace deceased heart valves. And currently, worldwide, there are about 2,000, uh, 280,000 replacements worldwide. And in young people, you put, they put in mechanical valves, which last, so to speak, forever. Metal does not break in this, they're mostly made of titanium. Or bioprosthetic heart valves, which are glutaraldehyde fixed natural biological heart valves, or pericardium, which can be used to make heart valves from. Unfortunately, in the, in the next 10 years after implantation, these patients develop problems. In one case, you have the thrombogenicity of these mechanical heart valves, which makes the people take lifelong medication. So they have to take; they are, are prone to get the stroke if they do not really uh, have the, uh, the, um, the the right anticoagulation, or they have the risk of bleeding if, if the anticoagulation is suppressed. The coagulation is suppressed to to too much degree. In the case of the biological uh, valves, we have the problem of calcification, so you have the loss of function of valves, either stenosis or regurgitation, as mentioned. And what is very dramatic, since heart valves are often affected in congenital heart diseases, children need heart valves. And since what, what's plant, implanted by the surgeon is just dead material, and the heart still gets larger in the first couple of years of life, they have to be reoperated. Every reoperation is, is a very strong uh, impact, has a very strong impact of the life of these patients. So people very early started to think about just to, to produce heart valve in the means of tissue engineering. And already in 2000, no, not 2019, 90, 95, the first publication came out of a group that has just applied uh, fibroblast and then the telial cells on a synthetic polycolic uh, acid fiber matrix and implanted these this, this heart valves into a sheep as a proof of principle. They functioned a couple of hours and that was fine. Work went on and soon the world was divided once more in two hemispheres the believers in the natural uh, natural matrices, which are Jakub and Hafrich, for instance, but also the people that believe it's more convenient to make a heart valve from de novo, just taking uh, biodegradable matrices, so on and so on, such as material. And <laughs> and these uh, this artificial ones are made with with these this molds. So, so they are molded and then you give the structure. For the material used for that you can think of any polymer that you can use. You just have to test first whether they are biocompatibility or whether they are toxic to the cells. If it's fine you can start just to seed cell on it. And this was reported in the, in the, in the literature in many, many different ways. So here is an example, uh, the heart valves, artificial heart valves that were seeded with mesenchymal stem cells, cultured in, in, in a bioreactor, and then implanted into a sheep, and eight weeks later it looks like that. So what happens, uh, the leaflets were retracted, they were swollen just by proliferation of these cells, and the heart valves have lost their function. And so in these days still, as the publication here from 2018, <laughs> even with the help of computer and designing certain, certain leaflet shapes and so on and so on, they are still struggling with these heart valves made out of polymers. 
As I mentioned, Havrich and also Jakub decided to go another way. They're just going to taking desolarization method, believing that the immunogens are sitting with the cells. If the cells are removed, the matrix just le uh, is left, the extracellular matrix, and this extracellular matrix is not immunogenic anymore. It's clear if you remove something from a structure, you will weaken the biomechanical stability. So it's a kind of a balance effect. You have to remove as much as possible, but still good enough for function, right? Since you have to have these valve functions. So people had uh, employed many, many different treatments. One go with trypsin. Trypsin is a protein, so it affects then the extracellular matrix uh, protein. So you have to really plan carefully in time what you do. If you use detergents, you can use any detergents. If you open up a catalog for Sigma, it does not exist here most probably as well, right? Sigma, you find 500 or even more de different detergents and you can start to use different concentrations for different lengths, for different combinations and so on and so on. And it takes a lot of time. But the idea what's behind with the detergents is biological cells have a cell membrane, and the cell membrane is made out of lip a double layer of lipids, and the detergents intervene into these lipids and, and make holes in it. So the, the cells die, they just leak out, and by this process, making small um, microcells out of the, of, of the membrane, also from the organelles, these things can be washed out. So you treat the the heart valve, for instance, treat with for 24 hours with the detergents, and then you have to wash, 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 because you have, have also to consider if you if this heart valve has to repopulate it with cells, the detergents should not sto stay in there, otherwise they kill the cells directly upon arrival. So, if you look at at the pulmonary artery, which is cut open, you see then here this. Three cusps, which are able to close, make the valve, and these cusps are made of this thin, thin structure here it is about 300 micrometers in diameter. After treatment with detergents, here you have the native situation of the wall, of, of here of the uh, the sinus and the cusp here. You see where you have the dark dots are the nuclei of the cell, and if you look at the desolarized one, all cells are gone, but the structure of the extracellular matrix stays more or less intact. It's more loosened, it's clear, we have washed out material, but, but the structure is maintained. So this looks from the outside, and then you can put it in a bioreactor. Then you have to reload. Hmm? What shall you reload? In principle, the cells that are cells, exactly. And the cells that are belonging there. But does anybody can tell me what are the preferred cells? What is the characteristic of the preferred cells? They should be from the future recipient. So if we have, we call them autologous, so if we can use autologous cells that we have isolated from the patient that will get the heart valve, we do not have to expect immunological reactions, we got their own, right? And I'll tell you a lot of, so we have to have for the heart valve, we have to have endothelium cells, uh, smooth muscle cells, and interstitial cells, which are mostly fibroblasts, myofibroblasts. But I, to make a long story short, the only thing that really is functioning is endothelial cells. First, if you use other cells, they do not really invade the, the matrix, they stay on the outside. And secondly, they just proliferate to the aspect, as I mentioned, of, of, the, of the medium that you use. They proliferate, but they proliferate in such a way that the leaflets get thicker and thicker. So. We just used endothelial cells at that time, and we used them from explanted veins or arteries, which are not problematic for an old organism, but if you think about that you have to treat children, you cannot really explant 
vessels from these children. So you have to look for other things. So you, if you have a very young child and you know that, or unborn child, and you know it has a heart problem, you can collect the umbilical cord uh, cells that you differentiate in the endothelial cells, or if it's very young, you also can just take peripheral blood, it functions as well, and since about 2008, the iPS cells have been invented, they also can generate or differentiate endothelial cells from iPS cells. So this cell, the, the valve is then put in a bioreactor and cells were seeded on it and after a while the cells have first to be trained to the flow so they are exposed to flow increasingly after a while they are really nicely attached to it you can see I mean it's, I'm sorry can you switch off the, the light totally here is this feasible otherwise you don't see anything Okay, this green stuff, what you can see here, are the endothelial cells attached to the, to, to the cusp. Mm. If you have a closer look, you see that, that they nicely cover the surface. And if you have a more closer look, you see that the cells really are oriented according to the flow that is what went th over this, this cusp surface. If you make up of it, you see... Yes? Uh, what was the marker? This is phalloidine. Phalloidine uh, attached to F actin. So you just stain the, the, the cell body. Uh -huh. And the nuclei is clear, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> if, if you cut it, then you see that the, the matrix is without cells, but you have here a thin lining, as expected, of endothelial cells which cover the whole surface. And if it goes ca a scanning electron microscopy, it looks like that. You have a smooth surface, so everything looks fine. Now to the principle, this is the sheep that should receive the valve. So you take the endothelial cells from the sheep, you amplify the cells, from the slaughterhouse you get the heart valve that you desolarize and then you recite this, this matrix, put them in this bioreactor under positive culture, mimicking physical conditions, you train them for flow and then you implant them into the sheep. And six months later it, everything looks perfect. You see this shiny, thin, uh, oh, the bad, finishing cusps, everything fine. Surprisingly, to us at least, was sheep that we used as controls where we have not added any endothelial cells, implanted just with the matrix. The naked na uh, matrix without cells looked the same. So, um, looking at the histology of these wells, you see in the, in the preceded one you have an endothelial layer here, you have nuclei that is seen in the HE stain, they are not just leftovers from a bad desalinization process, which could be all true as well, but you have alpha actin stain, so there are really cell bodies in there that are intact and you can stand for production of collagen. So these, these cells are invaded there from the host, from the recipient sheep, and they produce collagen, which means they remodel the, the heart valve. And after a while, by remodeling the heart valve, it becomes the sheep own heart valve once again. Right? So it, it's a thing. So, with other words, the question whether we need in vivo endothelialization, in vitro endothelialization, we can clearly answer with no, we don't need it. So, very early, uh, Professor Hafeich was also um, interested, is there a clinical application already here? And here you maybe have seen this picture. This is Professor Hafeich, this is Professor uh, Breimann. And this is a little guy, suffering little guy, here in Moldova. It's a, it's a hospital in Moldova, in the, actually in May 2002, where these two children have been operated. <coughs> they have received the desolarized heart valve matrix as a, as a heart valve replacement. Since they had severe problems with, with, with their heart valves after... Uh, um, Tetralogy of fallot operation. Three and a half years later, they 
they have shown a normal physio physiological development and if you check the increase of the body surface area was, was paralleled by an increase of the diameter of the heart valve which means the heart valve was growing or at least adapting to the growth of the children. Five years later you see even better and seven and a half years later the little lady became a mother and uh, for, at that time it was really a good time to investigate really the heart valve function and as you can see is no signs of valve degeneration. So young children normally that get the normal bioclutaldehyde fixed heart valves, they have to replace the heart valves every three years, three to four or four years, because they react much stronger than adults one. Here they just went up to adulthood. In 2012 they said these two surgeons here celebrated the 10 years anniversary of heart valve transplantation based on this matrix and you can see there is already a crowd of uh, young children and these days there are more than 300 and this is the last picture that I have of this, last, this young patient, huh? he's a young man with Sergei Chepotari here. So we can say tissue engineering of heart valve based desolarized heart valves is feasible and a safe method for replacement and in this this kind of heart valves have the ability or potential to remodel and grow in parallel with the growth of the patients. And this is very, very important. It was new for the world, really. Now the question is, does it also function in the, in the systemic uh, blood circle? Since these were pulmonary heart valves, the pressure there is 25 millimeter mercury maximum. Whereas if you look at in your systemic heart uh, circulatory circuit, you have a pressure normally of 120, 140, something like that. If you have been running or whether you got excited very much, it can rise up to 240, something like that, so that the, 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 the pressure on this heart valve is much higher. To make a very long story short, yes, it's feasible. You, we just desolarized the aortic heart valves, implanted them in Jeep, and it was perfect. This is very important since in young adults, as I mentioned, uh, normally mechanical valves are implanted. Mechanical valves need anticoagulation therapy. Anticoagulation therapy inhibit to, to become pregnant. Because you have these anticoagulations, you, do, 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 you cannot get, get, uh, get, you cannot get, be pregnant. Now this was a lady, uh, uh, or a woman that got, got on the 11th of April 2013, got a heart valve, aortic heart valve, that was desorized, implanted, and just about a year later she gave birth to a, a baby girl and she was absolutely happy because, with the, as I mentioned, with a regular heart valve or a mechanical heart valve, this would not be ha uh, possible. So, experimentally, we can pull at one uh, clinical, we have quite good experience with pulmonary heart valves, with aortic heart valves, and also started with mitral valves, but there is the, the business is much more complicated. Going back now, saying that, that we want to replace we want to replace parts of organs since we do not have the organs for transplantation we have a problem our heart valves that we have at the moment they are also from from human hearts so we still rely on donors on that right and if we want to implant the heart valves that are decelerized in, in small children, normally the donor are from adults, the heart valves are way too big. So we have a problem with limitations of availability and size restriction. A possible solution would be using heart valves from pigs. Then we would have unlimited number of heart valves and in Germany there are 30 million pigs killed for food every year and uh, you can 
hard, take hard loss from piglets, so the hard loss are really small, up to a 200 or 300 kilogram bore, which is the hard loss <coughs> is huge. Hmm? However, you see the problem. This, the method of desolarization was the same as for, for the so-called allogenic implantation, where a sheep, valve has been implanted in a sheep, where here a porcelain has implanted. So the leaflet gets thick. And here I have, say, I have to say that in, in humans, implantation in humans cannot be done at the moment because we have these this very well-known xenoantigens that are uh, exposed on porcelain material or, or mammal material that have to be removed, the alpha calipi tope for instance. This problem is solved at least in, 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 in the pig because we now have knockout pigs that, uh, that do not produce alpha gal anymore. But uh, nevertheless there are other, most probably glycans that are involved in the whole process. On this we are working at the moment. Now I have a problem. Why do I have a problem with, with this topic in this lecture here? Is this tissue engineering? Any opinion? So shall we vote? Is it tissue engineering? Is it not? No, it's not. We, we, we do not jungle anymore with cells. We just have matrix, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not tissue engineering anymore. In, a, in, a, in principle, we started with tissue engineering, as I say. Now we implant just the matrix, and the matrix, in, in principle, is now matrix-guided regeneration. So, regenerative therapies, but it's not tissue engineering anymore. Just uh, to be precise. For sure, also in tissue, cardiovascular tissue engineering, we, we need heart vessels. So we have done some work with fibrin, where in fibrin, you can take fibrin can be fibrin fibrinogen can be isolated from patient's blood, then just coagulate it, make uh, make a, a network of fibrin and add cells that can be isolated from patient in there. Here I have to say, in general, we are still looking for, on the whole world for uh, vascular prostheses. The problem is small diameter, low, slow flow. So if, if, the, if, if, the, if the diameter is large, everything is fine. But especially if for the corners <coughs> where the, the diameter is three to four millimeters and 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 you have a pulsatile pulsatile flow, we, we end up with calculation in the in the in the vessels. So the problem is not solved. Time is running, right? So we would like to talk about myocardial tissue as well, tissue engineering and there it becomes much more complex than with valves. Also here we have to have a matrix. The matrix itself has to be very pliable on one hand. It should not interfere with the contraction, so it will has to support the, the contractions of the heart. It should not, not be ruptured since, since the heart is a, is a hollow organ and if there is a hole in the wall the patient instantly dies. It's trivial. So uh, this is one thing. Then we have to have cells. As I mentioned, cardiomyocytes do not proliferate anymore. So they are... If you start tissue engineering with cardiomyocytes, that's it. So we only can use cells. We cannot generate new ones. <clears throat> then we have to somehow develop this tissue and it, ha it has to have a function. So, but just starting slowly. If we have an, in, a, an occlusion of the, of the coronary arteries here, this area is not perfused anymore. 
and here you just have the graph these are the hours down here if you can reopen the occlusion in, a, in the first half hour in the th first 30 minutes nothing happens as soon as and very quickly after two hours only 50 around 50 percent of the cardiomyocytes will survive in this area and if you, if you have an occlusion for 12 hours the area is almost dead. So what's going to happen in the myocardial infarction then? Thirty percent of the patients just die in the 24, uh, 24 hours. They, they die on, on arrhythmia. Another part of the patients die in the first week because this dead material that uh, is formed here is not tight anymore, so the ventricle can, can rupture, so they, they die from bleeding. And the rest will develop a scar in here, where the, the fibroblasts that are in, in the heart start to, to form a scar, which is quite dense, so it's not functional, not contractile. So we face the problem that we have to, to, to generate a tissue that has a certain thickness. If you look at the ventricle, ventricle thickness of a human, it's around, here it's written between seven and nine millimeter, let's say it's, it's about one centimeter. Hmm? If it's more, you call it hypertrophic. So this is one problem. So we have to have a large mass of tissue that we want to produce. And, we, and since this is so thick, we have to have a perfusion. Otherwise, we, we have the problem of these 200 micrometers that I, that I told you when we started this lecture. But already the fight among scientists starts, what is the composition of, of the cells that you have in the heart? If you talk about mass, you can say 80 to 90 percent of the mass is cardiomyocytes. But what's about the numbers? So we, as we know, the, depending on, on the, the workload that you have, the mass of the cardiomyocytes may increase or decrease. So if you look at this chart, you have just the cardiomyocyte to, 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 to normalize the whole table, and then you see the green are the endothelial cells, and the blue one are the fibroblasts, and it depending who has isolated from which species, from what, what kind of, of, of spot, you have total different ratios of these cells that you want to use in your tissue engineering. Can anybody tell me why this is like that? Yeah. Different size. Different size. No, then, then, then the numbers would be the same, right? But the problem is how, how, you, how you measure this. How, you how do you determine which, what is which cell? I mean, you have on one hand, you have the histology. There you do not really see, there you have a, just a thin cut of two or three micrometer thickness. Then you say, okay, here around. But, but already in the telia cells, you do not know how in the deep, how, how deep they are going, one. So do you, di you dissect the whole tissue and may, may flow uh, fax analysis. But there, your method has to be treat all cells the same to give them the same survival rate. If, if your method kills the large uh, cardiomyocytes, the number will be too slow of these. Hmm? So that's the problem here. So nobody really actually knows what is the truth. We assume it's, it's about that. Hmm? It's about uh, 50%. Here they say, here, it's about 30% cardiomyocytes in the mouse, as well as in the human. You have up to 50% of endothelial cells, and then you have some leukocytes. And then the unstains are what, for instance? What do you have in your heart as well? Give me a hand. Fibroblasts? Fibroblasts, sure. What else? Smooth muscle cells. Exactly. 
So, so you have different type of cells that are in there. And the fibroblast is already critical. Is there one type of fibroblast? Are there several types? Or are there myofibroblasts? Blah, 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 blah. So if you want to make now a construct, you have to make a certain decision, right? So you have to have cells. In the earlier times, we were totally uh, had to rely on neonatal rat hearts to isolate cardiomyocytes from. In these days, as I say, from, from pluripotent stem cells, either embryonic or IPS derived, IPS, you can differentiate cardiomyocytes. So, and then you have to make conglomerates of these cells that you mix with other cell types to a certain ratio. Then you get different structures that I will talk in a second, or a couple of seconds about that. But you also have to have a scaffold. Once again, we come to the hydrogels, so you can just embed the cells in a, in a hydrogel, which is either collagen or uh, come to my mind. Or you have synthetic scaffolds, or you have nano scaffolds, which most probably is interesting for you that are electrospun. <coughs> Or you have desolarized tissue, as is the case for the heart walls. Or you can use desolarized tissue and make an, an, an hydrogel out of it from, from this collagen. Then you expect some factors being present. Or you just take the cells and check them in the site and hope that they will integrate in, in the system that you have there. So the first trivial thing is the bundles. Just conglomerates of cells. And also here we have already in the uh, late 90s, we have two publications. One is from Eschenhorn. They used neonatal rat heart cells on a polymer and could show that these cells react and contract and so on. And these guys here used chicken cardiomyocytes but, uh, in rat collagen. But chicken is bird is not the same as mammals. I mean, so it's, it's quite a big difference. So, they put them into rings, they, the hydrogel solidify, and then you can generate these different constructs out made of these rings. You can arrange them in a star to get kind of a tissue, or you can put them on a two rods, then you get tubular structure. You can cut them open and just make a network, or you can bend them to a rope. And this group still works with this. Now, the one of the latest publications, they use human derived, IPS derived cardiomyocytes, they put in this here. Has anybody an idea why, why we have these holes in here? Higher cell viability? Yes, and why? So that there will be more cells uh, that are in contact with Exactly. So they, they just open up the structure that, that give access to the medium. Mm -hmm. It's not really hard like, right? <laughs> but you can work on that. In our group uh, or in our laboratories, we have a group that works with these so-called BCTs. They, they put the, the, the hydrogel in these two titanium rods and then you get the maturation through a couple of days seven days, you get also a tissue that nicely contracts, then you can put them in, the, in this bioreactor and you can measure forces. You can also, here is just the, the, how it's, it's condensed. And in this picture you see these neonatal rat cardiomyocytes PCTs as they go on, compare when they are stretched so they are mechanically loaded and you already can see that you can get striated uh, areas here where the heart muscle cells, the cardiomyocytes, get better differentiated. To control is just a, a rat heart here. They also worked with human derived IPS cardiac bodies. You can get the maturation as well. And you can go with this human ESC and IPS cardiac body derived PCTs. So they just go on with the cell type that I mentioned that are possible since, since 2008. 
This is another group. They, they also make uh, cardio bundles and uh, so they have experience if they put them on a, on a whipping table, they get a mechanical Im impact on, on the tissue. So this gives, gives them an, an more alignment here of this cardiomyocyte, a, a more differentiation also, also true for this human uh, derived cardiomyocytes. And if they are static, they just contract spontaneous. But if they are exposed to this dynamic competition culture system, the contraction is much stronger. And even it can be as a tissue, can be active way. Yes, it's running. You can be stimulated ele electrically. If one hurts, you see that it's nicely contracting. Others started to, to produce heart tissue by printing. It's very, very uh, new fashion, right? So you, you generate the kind of a bio ink. You have here neonatal cardiomyocytes from rats. You have heart this, uh, tissue derived desolarized exocell matrix and then you just make this this bio ink and, and produce what you have here then you culture them either in static conditions or with this dynamic condition with this whipping table and then you see that you get matured EHTs. This can also be done with a porcine heart, where you generate then the, the matrix from the, from the myocardium. You desolarize it, you, you get this uh, material that you can first liquefy, and then you, you put it in the bioink, and then you can print it as well. Another method of culturing myocardial tissue is, has been invented by more or less a Japanese group. They have invented thermoactive plastics. So normally in your tissue culture you have the cells until they are confluent. And if they are confluent you choose trypsin, in most cases just to isolate the cells. They individualize them, you put them, you can split them. Right? Splitting cells is done like that. They have a plastic which is is, is, is normal at 37 degrees, so the cells are growing on, on to a monolayer, and now instead of using trypsin, they just put the plastic yeah. tissue culture cells on 20 degree or 25 degree, and the whole, the whole sheet of cells get detached as a, as a, as a whole. Now, having now this cell sheet, you, you can start now stacking up this, this uh, three, on making 3D uh, constructs. So, um, doing this, you see here the picture and just from the reflection you see that you have a sheet that is contracting here on the surface. One problem is here, by detaching that the sheet as you have here, the whole sheet just scrambles. Mm -hmm. So having a sheet down here, which, which is about 220 micrometers in thickness, you can end up here in the double of it. Also the size has decreased. So what can we see here? So, but the heat sheets then can be brought onto a piece of muscle and you can see how have this glissing here. Also on this tissue you have a contraction. This was done first with neonatal rat cardio, uh, cardiomyocytes, but it also can be done with iPS-derived cells, put now on a porcine heart, or they are even conducting the first clinical trials. Uh, Professor Salvas from Osaka University uh, to put this on patients. Now another possibility are the patches, as we as a result you just in a way generate holes in here or you make it dense but not that thick. In our lab or in my lab we're using desolarized porcine from, from pig. 
then we get this, this kind of sausage here, which we can cut open and put into a frame. And this frame, or this material, is already FDA approved. It can, could be used for implantation, and in our, in our hands, it's, the, it's the, the material that carries the construct, which is then a, a surgeon could use to suture the, the material onto to the heart, for instance. So the idea is having this on, on the frame here. We make a construct on top with, at that part time, with neonatal rat heart cells and matter gel collagen, uh, and collagen, and make a con combined construct which stays like that. If you looked at the microscope, you see that they get oriented here the cardiomyocytes in the longitudinal axis, and you get get not a shrinkage in 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 the total, just in the height. You can show that they are electrically coupled. Coupled, you can add isoprotonol and increase the beating frequency of this uh, spontaneous beating. And the funny thing is, or the interesting thing is, if, if you work with neonatal rat cardiomyocytes, you co-isolate endothelial cells from these rat hearts, and they're still in there when you mix it. And these endothelial cells start to form a network after having reassembled and reformed the, the cardiomyocytes structure. Now, using a, a, a bioreactor, where the probe is put in here, you can, we can apply a mechanical stimulus, and you see that we have a, a much better elong elongation of the cells. They here, an untreated one, they look in all different ways. Here they are nicely oriented, and, and the power they develop in shortage is much stronger. So. I'm sorry. So, uh, his, this is the untreated patch, so it's spontaneously contract, as you can see here. If you have stimulated it first with one word for, for two days, you get, get a very tr a nicely trained uh, tissue which contracts. And if you look at the gene expression, and you see that with, with this mechanical stimulation that the cells are more maturated even in these times. Other groups are working on, on as well as on this cardio patch. This is 7 by 7 millimeters. And also they can show with this that they have an increase of maturation over time with their, their used cells. They have also a nice connection of the cells that can be stimulated and here Okay. You can they use it in here, they activate. Then you can see by eye that the whole patch is construct, uh, contracting or even here spontaneous. And then you can it give even a, a certain rhythm by one hertz stimulation going up. Now others, they want to make a heart or piece of heart just by desolarization, a whole heart. So the heart is desolarized and then repopulated with cells, either autologous cells or heterologous cells from another other, uh, donor. And then they try to, to isolate or look at the functions. In 2008, this, this paper came out where they, they desolarized full or whole rat hearts and repopulated then the, the heart either with injection of cardiomyocytes, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and smooth muscle cells. And also through the, the or through the coronaries, they injected endo, endothelial cells, and they get this ni nice contraction. But this contraction is just two percent work that is normally given from a normal heart. So you cannot live with that. Others are the, uh, working with porcelain hearts. Uh, here you can see that. If the desalization, the, the vessel bed of these hearts are nicely maintained, and others are dealing with human, human hearts. 
but you may hope, I hope that you have recognized it's all just basic. The only thing is they can just do thin layers or tiny little things. And why? Why is that? They miss the vascularization. So you cannot, can really not provide them the perfusion that you need. And considering that if you, if you want to, if you want to, generate a piece of hard muscle in, in vitro and you want to apply it of a certain thickness and you want to apply it surgically to, the, to, to the, the patient you have to have vessels that a surgeon is able to suture in. So we have to have at least one millimeter that the, uh, a person can suture it and we have to have capillaries which are much smaller in here that are needed for the perfusion. So we have to have the whole range of, of vessels of this diameter in the whole thing. Otherwise, our construct that we put into the patient will die in the next four, four, five, six hours, as we have in the myocardial infarction. So it doesn't help much if we just replace a scar by a scar. So people think about as well here, we, where they made these this, uh, this loops, arteriovenous loops, just make short shortcuts among muscles, put them in, in, in a box, add here cardiomyocyte and see that they, they get the ingrowth of capillaries there, other using muscle flaps, so they isolate a certain muscle that you have somewhere with an, with an artery and, and a vein, and on this flap they try to, to produce then the, the myocardial tissue on top, so they have, that you can use this, this artery in the vena for implantation. And here these Japanese guys, they, they use these uh, cell sheets, they implanted them under the skin of a rat, let it vascularize there. In, in principle, is this here, you have the sheets, you put them on, on a region that is, is really perfused, and you get an ingrowth of these thin layers, and then you can increase the thickness by that. They have done this in the rat heart as well, so this, this distance here is 10 times polysurgery, they call it, and in between each surgery there is one day. So if you look at the scale here, 500 micrometers is about one millimeter. If you consider to do that in human, where you have to have one centimeter, you can, have, you can think about that you have to have a hundred polysurgery, which means two hundred days, and I don't know whether it's feasible to open a uh, human patient every second day you put down a new layer, right? So the technique in principle is feasible, but it does not... is practicable. So the other idea is to put them close to the vessels where you have an arteria and vena, and then you do the very same thing, then you can transplant this already, and they have done this in the rat. I do not want to go in that. The last thing I want to... I'm sorry, it's almost an hour from that past. The last thing is you can do three ping of personalized uh, materials. So you take from the omentum, you make a personalized hydrogel, you make a bio ink, and from the cells that you isolate, also from the moment you make iPS cells, which you get then differentiate in the cardiomyocytes and then the telium cells, you put them in the bio ink and you can print your heart like this. So, with other words, you have the momentum. Here you can make this, this uh, hydrogel, and here you have the, the, the iPS cells versus the, uh, the differentiated endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes, which even get, get more differentiated over time. Whether this is a solution is another question. If you consider that you are, if you take cells that you first have to cultivate, then you have to, to reprogram them to iPS cells. Hmm? Takes a, four weeks at least. Then you have to differentiate when them once again in, in, the, in the, the right direction. And for just, just to give you a number for, for a normal myocardial infarction, you need about one billion, one billion cardiomyocytes. So it's, uh, if you take back this to the patient that had a heart and body, he will be die until he uh, until he get his implant. 
And the last thing is the differentiation of these cardiomyocytes that I will just quickly see. So if you take a human ventricular cardiomyocyte, you have here the isometric force which is developed is 51 millinewton per square millimeter. And then this is what is reached over time here. And it can be even reached, but this once again are rat cells, not human cells. So we, meanwhile, the best results that they got from differentiation is is half of what is normally done. Why is this so? The problem, as you may may aware of or not, cardiomyocytes differentiate from iPCS cells do not really differ and differentiate to really mature cardiomyocytes, and nobody knows so far why. And if you consider that you had to, that you want to build up the heart based on iPS cells, you have first you have to know what kind of cells are in there. So, so you know cardiomyocytes, you know endothelial cells. This is feasible, but to to get a, a stable network of endothelial cells, you have to have pericytes. So you have also to differentiate pericytes. In the, from iPS cells, you have to differentiate fibroblasts. You have to differentiate smooth muscle cells. And this is still all not given. So the problems that we have in 2018 is we have to scale up, we have to have a vascularization, we have the maturity problem, we have to have an electrical integration of, of the tissue that you put on the heart, I have not talked about that, and you have to to, to deal with immunogenicity because you cannot use your own iPS cells. So one idea that is coming and is very modern is to generate IBS cell banks. So you you, you have then you t uh, you type uh, your type that you need as you have it with your bone marrow cells. If you have a leukemia, you can ask for from the cell bank whether they have a fitting cell line or uh, it's the same thing here. So just to end up here, it's still a long way to go from non-immunogenic differentiated functional cells, as I mentioned before, to perfused implantable fully viable functional myocardial construct without the potency of tumorigenesis and rejection. And here is just a, a, a picture of how complicated these different fibers are built the heart, which is a topic that I have not addressed either here in this talk. So would like to end here. Questions? Yes? From all the methods that you described, and um, obviously they're not all equally successful, I'm curious what your opinion is the most promising projects and approach to, to, to develop a tissue engineered heart or, or cardiac patch. <laughs> I mean, I personally have stopped working with cardiomyocytes at the moment. We, we are working on, on making a, a matrix that is perfusible as a, as a starter kit, so to speak, where we have an inflow and an outflow track, which the surgeon can really adhere to. And on that, we want to then add some, some myocardial uh, muscle cells to, to get oriented and, and stretched and, and stimulated to have a certain direction. The last point that I mentioned, I have no idea how we, we can get these, these different orientations of these different fibers because the one stimulation that we have gives give an orientation in one direction. Mm -hmm. So you maybe can consider to lay di di different one over each other and get the cumulative effect of, of contraction which needs the shorten, shortage. This is one thing. And the other thing is, this is, is my belief, um, people have not really worked with enough with iPS cells and I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether the iPS cells that are generated in these days are really good iPS cells, whether you, it's not feasible to push them more backwards to, to embryonic stem cells to really allow them go through, them through the differentiation to all possible cell types to all the degree that are needed. So far, we just know if you if, if mix the mixed embryo with iPS cell, stem cells, you, you get in this, in this animal that gets produced, you get all, all tissues formed out of these iPS cells. So they're really uh, pluripotent. But maybe we have not looked close enough whether they really reach the end of differentiation or some cell types are missing out. So, so the standardization of the iPS cells, where you start from, has to be clearly 
identified. This is one thing. And also something that we are working on is this, this story with the pericytes. The pericytes are very important cells that are needed for, for the network of the endothelial cells that they stay stable. The problem there is if the network is too stable, it, it, it's not dynamic anymore. And we know, at least from in the pregnancy, for instance, the heart is growing in size and, and dramatically increasing the, the capillary density. And as soon as the baby is born, it, 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 it gets rebuilt. Mm? Re so that the, the, the capillaries, even in our normal heart, is very dynamic. And this, we have no clues in these days yet. I'm sorry to say so. Cardiomyocytes derived from embryonic stem cells, do you think they are better or...? The problem there, they are not autologous, so they are not typicized, and you, and you do not have your own uh, embryonic stem cells. Any. They, like, physiologically they normally get, get further than the IPS cells, yes. But also there, I mean, at least in Germany, the, it's very re uh, strictly regulated which kind of lines of embryonic stem cells you are able to use for scientific purposes. I mean, this is a story which may be, I don't know, may, maybe in, in England it's different meanwhile. It's the same. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions? So you are all dead. I talk too much. Then I, I think. Ah. Uh, what is your preferable uh, detergent that you use for uh, valve desolarization? Okay. At the moment, we are using Triton X and SDS on one hand, and, and Trypsin, Triton X. And uh, the problem with is SDS. It's a very good uh, detergent for the purpose, but it also is, is somehow very tightly bound to collagen. So it's hardly, very, very hard to wash it out after the desalization uh, process. I use uh, alcohol, I found the uh, paper, they use alcohol, 70% alcohol to wash out the SDS. Yes, the problem with the ethanol is, and they most probably use ethanol, right? If you say alcohol, ethanol. Yes, ethanol. ethanol. Ethanol is, is tends to, to cross-link certain proteins, which is not good. And the reason is, why, why do uh, glutaraldehyde heart valve matrices or heart valves are not become viable again? The reason is the cross-linking of the protein is, is, is uh, by chance. It's not, and the cells that should penetrate it, this tissue do not have the enzyme to crack certain, certain boundaries, certain, certain uh, bindings. And the same holds true for ethanol. It, it might be that you affect the stability or just the, the, the biomechanical properties of, of the tissue that if you desolarize. Mm -hmm. uh, However, if you use trypsin, as I mentioned, uh, you affect really the surface. You, 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 you degradate the basal membrane. So the basal membrane, the smooth surface that is left when you use SDS and SNC, people believe that it's nice for endothelial cells to sit down. On the other hand, endothelial cells also sit down on electrospun material. And the first thing they do when they sit down, they make their own basal membrane. So uh, you, often you read in the, in, in the literature things that, that are logic. But people have not proved it. It's just logic in our sense of human sense. Hmm? It's smooth, I sit down, but it, it's not, it, it might be not true for the cells. They do not need it. I'm sorry. You have another question? Yes, I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, now, uh, um, how much time do you need to make a desolarization of one valve, for example? Okay, the valve. <laughs> We, we get the valve either from the operation room or from the... From a sheep, a sheep valve. From a sheep, yeah, from the slaughterhouse. We take it home, we, we just put it for, for 24 hours, the pulmonary valve for 24 hours in detergent, with one change. 2%, uh, 1%? 0.5% uh, each, SDS, SD. And then uh, we normally wash six to seven days. First, we, uh, one day with water, with uh, sterile water, and then we use PBS. 
without antibiotics because we also have to be sure this is an important point. We also have to be sure that we do not have a bacterial contamination. If you have such a one, if you implant it in the animal, you get very strong against the, the valve, but it's not against the valve, it's against the bacteria that were on, on the valve. I have experience, I have visualized with SDS for one colleague, and uh, he uh, peritoneum and uh, pericard. Uh -huh. And he transplanted them in a defect of diaphragma. Yeah. Uh, after eight and ten weeks, the the transplant was broken. Okay. What means broken? Does it got calcified? Yes. Yes, it was calcified, and uh, not the, all of them were calcified, but they were. The transplant was broken, and there uh, was a visceration. Was. Mm. To be honest, I do not really know whether sheep is good and, uh, good organism, organism to test this. Because sheep is extremely... Uh, experiment was on the rabbits. Excuse me? The experiment was made on rabbits. On rabbits, okay. And uh, then it's okay. I don't know. Might be that you have not... I mean, the pericardium is also very thin, right? This is, you have also there, you have around 500 micrometers, something like that. Sometimes a little bit depends on this... Uh, on the place they have you taken and uh, the pericardium contains much more fat than the heart valve uh, matrix so it might be also uh, to, to think about your ethanol thing there because you extract uh, and and yeah I said but it might be it might be beneficial in this particular case so, was it uh, interspecies, what, the rabbit in rabbit, or...? No, no, that was uh, from uh, cow. From beef? From beef, yes. Okay. Since, since the fat, are the sphingolipids, also are well, heavy, have, uh, are heavy no, carriers of glycan. And the glycan pattern is species-specific. So if you have still fat in your, in your tissue that you implant, you, you bring in xenogenes. So, so you have an immunological reac against, uh, reaction against what you have implanted. It normally reacts in calcification. This is what, I mean, I have not seen it, but this is what I would expect here. Another question. <laughs> Uh, uh, how do you look at the utilization for the solarization of the acids? Hydrochloric acid, uh, acetic acid. I used uh, hydrochloric acid for <laughs> cartilage desolarization. Uh -huh. and, uh, he desolarized uh, rapidly. Uh, uh, I, we have made uh, also uh, DNA quantification. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, when we used uh, hydrochloric acid, the solarization was uh, practically 99%. That you have lost the DNA? Yes. Okay. Are you sure that the DNA is not there anymore? 99%. So how <laughs> have this also here, how have you determined that the content on DNA? Uh, with the kids uh -huh. or DNA quantification. So you, you used a spin column? Right? That, yes, Buffers. Yes, yes. Okay. There are different methods. And are, sometimes if you apply different methods, you get totally different answers. <laughs> Especially if you use in a whole digest with proteinase K and then you add some, some hooks, uh, you get, get high numbers. Mm -hmm. I can't, I mean... I, I personally have no experience with hydrochloric acid and another guy in the lab was using perchloric acid for desolarization of pores and pericardium. But there it also changed, I mean, suddenly co collagen 4 was missing and I do not believe this result. I, I, I personally think that it just it masked or changed the, 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 the epitopes of collagen for so the antibody does not recognize it anymore. This is another problem. I mean, how do you prove what you have in there? So you are relying on antibodies, or you normally do not mass spectrography to, to really identify the proteins are that are in there. But I, we do not want. I mean, you, we still can. You can ask a question, but I, I think all others are looking now for the break, and right or the next talk.
Tudor, you take over. Yeah, we have a very short break, like five minutes, if it's okay for you. And uh, after that, Andre will start his, uh, his presentation.